Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Well, I hope no one calls the fire marshal. Um, this is a great crowd and a great gathering here at the beginning of our 143rd academic year here at Augsburg as we commence the 2012-2013 academic convocation series with this Bernard Christensen Symposium. This is uh, always the first event in our convocation series that begins our academic year um, in honor of the legacy of Bernard M. Christensen, the sixth president of Augsburg College, who served from 1938 to 1962. Bernard Christensen was a remarkable man, a scholar, a teacher, a public figure who set forth a set of values and principles that in many ways still define the work of this college. We are very privileged this morning to be joined by two members of the Christensen family, uh, Bernard's uh, and Gracia's daughters, uh, Sonia and Nadia, who are over here. Well, please wave. <laughs> so. I would just ask you to note on the back of your program the uh, other uh, events in the series that will happen throughout the year, and it's an exciting lineup for 2012-13. It is my great pleasure to introduce um, our friend and colleague and partner in important interfaith work, uh, Ibu Patel. Dr. Patel is the founder and the president CEO of the Interfaith Youth Corps, which was founded 10 years ago in Chicago. Ibu grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. He went to the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana for his undergraduate degree, received a Rhodes Scholarship and earned a PhD in the sociology of religion at Oxford University. Throughout the past 10 years, Ibu has been an instigator, an inspiration, a challenge to all of us to think about how we might live in a more pluralistic world. Uh, in particular, uh, when he first visited Augsburg College in 2007 as our commencement uh, speaker, he gave a really compelling speech called the Cathedrals of Pluralism. And in that speech, he challenged us to think about how we might, and especially he was speaking to our graduates, become the architects of the Cathedrals of Pluralism in our world. And by this, he meant to build places that are beautiful both on the inside and the outside so that others might join us. It was an address that many of us will always remember for the ways that it drew us into the beauty of that, of that vision but also one that started a long partnership here between Augsburg College and the Interfaith Youth Corps in thinking about how we as a community could join Ibu and his colleagues on that path. We now hear uh, some uh, six years later are gathered uh, with Ibu and his colleagues Kyle and Laura who are with us uh, for these two days. And as you see from your program, a variety of events that have happened starting yesterday afternoon that have drawn us into this important work, uh, not just the inspiration to do it, but in fact, how we build the capacity, how we develop the skills to do this. Uh, Ibu has written two very powerful books out of his own experience. The first is called Acts of Faith, uh, which was published a couple years ago. Uh, his most recent book, which was just published this summer, is called Sacred Ground, Pluralism, Prejudice, and the Promise of America. And those of those books uh, are on sale in the lobby, and there'll be people from Barnes & Noble there after the, uh, after the talk to, um, to sell those and to, to make them available for you. I have to say that they are, they are a compelling uh, picture, if you will, of, of Ibu's journey in this work, and we have a, the great privilege this morning to hear directly from him as he speaks to us on the topic, The Holiness of Common Ground, Ibu Patel. The things about people reading your bio is they leave out the most interesting parts here was the most interesting thing that happened to me yesterday. Um, I got lost on the way here about nine times. Am I the only guy that, get, that gets lost in this neighborhood, by the way? So I was talking to Reverend Sonia Hagender as I was uh, trying to get my way here, and she's like, no, no, don't turn left on that cedar. Turn left on the other cedar. <laughs> so as I'm trying to work my way around all of this, I let out this, I see this guy I know, and I let out this barbaric yawp. Keith! That's Muslim rage for you right there, by the way. <laughs> it was Keith Ellison at the corner. And I thought to myself, how perfect. How perfect. Because at a time when the evening news is telling the story, choose your side, plant your flag, point your gun. 
Keith Ellison reminded us of a different story. It reminded us of the story of staking out a different territory and saying, this is a place where we have a common life together. This is the tradition of my faith and of my nation. If you remember a few years ago, when Keith was running for Congress here, when he finally got elected, first Muslim in American history to get elected to Congress. There were, there were a set of people who said he shouldn't be able to take the oath of office on the Holy Quran. That America was a nation for only one faith of people, and that's the book that you swear your oath of office on. A representative for, from Virginia said that if Keith Ellison took his oath of office on the Quran, that it would open up the doors of America to the Muslim hordes from all over the world. Immigrants like Keith, who would arrive on the steps of Capitol Hill demanding their Qurans. Keith could have planted his flag, could have chosen a side, matched ugliness with ugliness. He could have pointed his gun and said, he walked across the street to the Library of Congress and he went to the rare books librarian and he requested the Quran owned by the author of the Declaration of Independence, one of America's first presidents, Thomas Jefferson. And he took his oath of office on that. And it was a reminder to me, and I think to all of us, of what it means to gently fly a different flag. The flag of pluralism. The flag of the idea that in a world in which some people say we are better apart, better divided, better when one group is dominating another group, that actually, that's not the American tradition. The American tradition says, we're better together. There is this beautiful insight in the work of political philosopher Michael Walzer. He writes that for centuries in the world of political philosophy, people were convinced that you could only have democracy in homogenous territories. People had to be of the same ethnicity or race or religion. Otherwise, there's no way they would allow somebody from a different group to be elected as their leader. They would revolt. Walzer ends that section and begins the next one with these words, except in the United States of America. We are the first nation to give rise to the idea that people from the four corners of the earth praying in Hebrew and Latin and Greek and Arabic and English and praying not at all can come together and build a country. And actually, the stake was put in the ground before this land was a nation. In the 1650s, in what was known then as New Amsterdam, now New York, the Governor General Peter Stuyvesant banned Quaker prayer meetings, said that those are rabble-rousers and seducers of the people. By the way, has anybody ever been to a Quaker prayer meeting? <laughs> they don't even talk. So much for rabble-rousing. In many places and many times, that would have been it. Another religious community banned, another prayer practice banished. Not here. A group of 30 people in what is now Flushing, Queens, maybe the most religiously diverse area in America, came together and penned something called the Flushing Remonstrance, which is often called the first statement of religious freedom in this land. Actually, it's much more than that. You know what it is? It's a statement of what it means to be a neighbor. It's a statement of what it means to be part of a beloved community. Here are the lines. The law of peace, love, and liberty should extend to Jews, Turks, and Egyptians as they are all sons of Adam. Whoever comes unto us with kindness and goodwill, we will give them free egress and regress, not just of our town, but of our homes. We are committed to seeing in independents, Presbyterians, Quakers, and Baptists the light of God in all. That is 1657 in Flushing, Queens. For their efforts, half of them got put into jail, others got banished, but they put a stake in the ground. 
of what this nation is about. Early in his term of office, our first president, George Washington, receives a message from a man named Moses Sessius, the leader of the Newport Congregation, the Hebrew Congregation of Newport, Rhode Island, Jewish synagogue, late 18th century, America. Sessius was scared. What was going to happen to his people in the new nation? He knew well what had happened to Jews elsewhere for too long, hounded and hated and harassed. He writes Washington, will we be safe here? Here's what our first president writes back. The government of the United States of America will give bigotry no sanction and persecution no assistance. We welcome all those who demean themselves as good citizens. May the children of the stock of Abraham sit in safety under their own vine and fig. Let there be none to make them afraid. He ends the letter with this line. May the Lord of all mercies scatter light and not darkness and make us useful, each of us, in our vocations and give us everlasting happiness in his own way. 1791, America. The first president to host an iftar of a Muslim in America was not Barack Obama, although he hosted, he hosts them. It was not Bill Clinton, although he hosted them. It was not George W. Bush, although he hosted them too. The first president to host an iftar was Thomas Jefferson. It was George Washington who appointed the envoy who negotiated the Treaty of Tripoli, which said that this country would never enter into arguments or fights or wars over religious differences. It was John Adams who put that treaty before the Senate to get ratified. It was Benjamin Franklin who built a hall in Philadelphia and said that the pulpit of this hall would be open to preachers of all types and stripes, including a Muslim from Constantinople. It was Jane Adams in the late 19th century at a time when Catholics and Jews were pouring into this nation because of the economic strife in southern and eastern Europe, a time when xenophobic and bigoted forces were on the rise. It was Jane Adams, not a mile from the office where Interfaith Youth Corps now stands, who said that those people are not strangers, they are citizens built something called Hull House, called it a cathedral of humanity, said America should embody the spirit. And it was Martin Luther King Jr. who after 380 days of leading the Montgomery bus boycott, people not only walking to work, but experiencing death threats and fire bombings, suicides. It was Martin Luther King Jr. who when asked by a journalist if he wasn't just a little bit angry over all that they had to go through and how small the victory was in the end, the ability to sit front to back on buses in one provincial city in the American South in the middle of the 20th century. There's Martin Luther King Jr. who said, we have the opportunity to inject a new vision of love into the veins of our civilization. This isn't the time for anger. This isn't the time for revenge. This is the time to build the beloved. That's the American project. And one of my favorite stories is a story of a starving village. Folks huddled alone in their homes, scared of each other. This traveler comes through. He's got a backpack, sets up camp in the middle of the village. He brings out a stone in a pot and he builds a fire and he says to folks I can feed you and people gather around and he stirs the stone in the pot and he tastes it and he says it's pretty good but I think it needs some carrots and one of the people in the circle says hey we got carrots and goes home brings carrots they slice them up and they throw them in the pot Stirs the pot, tastes it, he says, closer, I think we need some celery. Somebody in the circle says, we got celery. They go home, they get the celery, they bring it back, they slice it up, they throw it in the pot. And on and on and on. I got to tell you something. When I tell my kids that story, my two-year-old and my five-year-old American Muslim kids, 
I'm telling them the story of a nation. The promise of America is that we grant equal rights to all communities and all people. The genius of America is that communities and people granted their dignity will build up that society. Think of Augsburg College. The Lutheran tradition allowed and invited to flourish in America expresses itself in this institution which nurtures a Lutheran identity by saying we are proud to welcome the talents of our Somali Muslim, our Hmong shaman, our secular humanist, our Native American, and every other student who comes here. That's the type of Lutheran college we are. America has 600 Catholic hospitals, 230 Catholic colleges, 7,000 Catholic grade and high schools, one of which on the north side of Chicago, a young Zayd Patel wreaked significant havoc in for the two years he was a preschooler there. Where would America be without its Lutheran colleges, its Catholic high schools, its Southern Baptist disaster relief organizations? We require the contributions of our many communities to this society. And for that to happen, what do you need? You need the traveler who strolls into the village, who looks around at folks and says, you know what? You're not better apart. We're better together. And we got to figure out a way to come together, to invite those contributions, to nurture that cooperation. In other words, it's leaders who build this. And one of the things about each one of those examples I gave at the beginning, Thomas Jefferson's Quran, John Adams and the Treaty of Tripoli, George Washington and Give Bigotry No Sanction, the Flushing Remonstrance, King and the Beloved Community, Jane Addams and Hull House, is each one of those examples is an example of a leader, sometimes a president, sometimes just a citizen, standing up and saying, I just don't believe the narrative that we're better off killing each other. I just don't believe we have to be huddled alone in our homes. I believe that we can create a space where we're better together. I'll tell you something, at a time in which much of the world is convinced of the clash of civilizations, of the inevitability of conflict between people from different identities, this American tradition of better together, man, I don't know when it's been more important. You know what it needs? It needs a group of people who are going to write the next chapter. Because I'll tell you something. In each one of those earlier chapters, the forces of pluralism were not destined to win. They didn't fall from the sky. They didn't rise from the ground. In each one of those earlier chapters, there were angry, loud forces of prejudice saying, Jews don't belong here. Rising up as the Know Nothing Party in the 1850s, taking up 25% of Congress on a single plank in their platform. This nation is a Catholic free zone. America is America because the forces of pluralism defeated the forces of prejudice. So what of our times now? What of you here? I'll never forget January 20th, 2009. I'm standing in the National Mall, freezing with two million of my favorite citizens, watching the first black president take the oath of office and give his inaugural address. Staring out at all of us, looking into the eyes of Abraham Lincoln in the Lincoln Memorial and saying these words, our patchwork heritage is a strength, not a weakness. We are a nation of Christians and Muslims, of Hindus and Jews and non-believers. And because we have been through those bitter chapters of segregation and civil war and come out stronger and more united, we know that a shrinking planet reveals our common humanity and that America is going to play its role as a force for peace in the world once again. Six weeks later, 
I found myself in the Oval Office, the first meeting of President Obama's inaugural Faith Council. And he got down to business right away. He said, I want four things from you people. Number one, I want your faith communities and your civic communities to rededicate themselves to service in America. We need your contribution. Number two, you got to do that service together. We can't be apart doing this. You got to bridge that social capital. Number three, yes, this is for the strength of our nation, but it's also an example to the world. Because right now, there are too many people who believe in the inevitability of conflict. And so you have to show them the possibility of cooperation. And number four, and this is what shocked all of us in that room, young people need to lead this. Young people need to lead this. Jim Wallace, my friend and mentor, founder of Sojourners, elbows me in the ribs and says, I think he's talking about that movement of young interfaith leaders on college campuses that you all have been involved in. And I thought to myself, yeah, I think he is. I think he is. So what does it mean to be an interfaith leader in the early 21st century in America? What does it mean to fly the flag of better together in a world that's flying the flag of better apart, better divided, better dominating? I think it means you do three things. Number one, you voice. Right? There's this line in Ani DeFranco, you're only as loud as the noises you make. And one of the crazy things about the world that we live in is that extremists and bigots, man, can they make noise. Man, do they have a strategy to get on the evening news. My wife was with our five-year-old and two-year-old getting an errand done the other day. And there are all these people on television shouting the word Allah and waving their fists and burning flags. And my son turns to his mother and says, we use the word Allah. We pray like that. What are they doing? And I think to myself, of all the uglinesses in representations of religion, to represent a faith to its children in a way that illustrates ugliness and anger, that is amongst the highest crimes. But those people know exactly what they are doing. So what do we do? We have to voice the other ethic. We have to voice how our traditions speak to pluralism. There is this beautiful story in Islam the Prophet Muhammad welcomes a delegation of Christians, the Christians of Nadran, into the city of Medina. It's the city of the Prophet. And they argue theology. The argument gets heated because Muslims and Christians disagree on important matters, cosmically, the nature of Jesus. And when it came time for the Christians to pray, they asked the Prophet if they could have leave of the city so that they may go outside its limits and offer their prayers. The prophet invited them into his mosque and said, I want you to pray here. And there was confusion in both the Christians and the Muslims, but we've just been arguing. The prophet said, yes, but that doesn't mean I don't offer you hospitality. That is a primary ethic of a Muslim. Amidst our differences, we illuminate the commonalities, and we always offer hospitality. That's the gentleness of Islam. One of the most inspiring traditions that I know is the tradition that founded this college, the Lutheran tradition. And for me, its most inspiring 20th century figure is Dietrich Bonhoeffer, great German Lutheran pastor studies at Union Theological Seminary, is a teacher there in the late 1930s, watches from here as his nation burns, decides that he needs to be a witness up close, takes the last ocean liner going back from America to Germany to be that Christian witness. And when the Nazis engage in a particularly heinous destruction of Jewish communities and people, Dietrich Bonhoeffer 
gets on German radio and says these words. Those who did not speak out for the Jews do not deserve to sing Gregorian chants. There is a justice requirement that precedes the privilege of worship in your tradition and in my tradition. There is a solidarity at the heart of both of our traditions. At the roots, you will find examples of how our communities have been in partnership. The first person to recognize the prophethood of Muhammad was a man that the sources say was learned in the scriptures. What does it mean to be learned in the scriptures in the early 7th century in the western half of the Arabian Peninsula? It means that man, Waraka, was a Christian. The first person to know of this new religious civilization flowering in its midst was someone who never converts, but nurtures it respectfully and lovingly. These are the stories of pluralism from your tradition, from my tradition. These are the stories that interfaith leaders give voice to. Second thing that interfaith leaders do is they engage. They engage with each other. We know this from the social science. By the way, as somebody with a PhD in a related area, I am happy to confess that part of what we do as social scientists is confirm common sense. This is my favorite piece of common sense when it comes to interfaith cooperation. That if you know somebody from a different religious background, even one person, if you know a Mormon, if you know a Buddhist, if you know an evangelical, if you know an atheist, your views towards that entire community improve. Not only that, Robert Putnam and David Campbell teach us in their terrific book, American Grace, your views towards other religious communities improve as well. That's the power of engaging with each other. You know who, for me, exemplifies that ethic? Martin Luther King Jr., prince of the black church, grows up, son of a Baptist preacher, grandson of a Baptist preacher, great-grandson of a Baptist preacher in Atlanta, goes to a Baptist college called Morehouse, says that being a Baptist preacher is his being and his heritage. Goes to seminary. Goes to a talk as a seminary student called Christian Love by a great African-American scholar, Mordecai Johnson, Fellowship House, Philadelphia, 1950. Mordecai Johnson uses as the embodiment of Christian love in that talk, the example, not primarily of Jesus Christ, but of who Martin Luther King Jr. would later call the greatest Christian of the 20th century, the best follower of Jesus Christ that we know, an Indian Hindu, Mahatma Gandhi. And I think to myself, what have... What must young Martin Luther King Jr. have been thinking in that lecture hall? It might have been a part of him who was like, I just, I can't take the idea that somebody from a different tradition embodies a precious ethic in my own in startling and inspiring ways. Instead, King engages with Gandhi. And I have this image of King back at Crozier Theological Seminary with a stack of Christian books on his left, Walter Rochenbusch, Reinhold Niebuhr, Paul Tillich, the Bible, and on his right, the half dozen books that he says he bought on Gandhi after that talk, and thinking to himself, how did Gandhi find in the Hindu scriptures the ethic of nonviolence? What gave him the strength to accept other people's truncheons upon his head and still say that nonviolence was an active approach to social reform? How can I find that in Christianity? That's the electric current underneath the civil rights movement right there. King says of Montgomery, Jesus Christ gave us the inspiration, but Mahatma Gandhi, an Indian Hindu, gave us the method. That's the power of engaging with another religious tradition. It shines a different light on your own. It answers the question, what do we have on common? And more importantly, what can we do together? And on that question, there's an example for me, another one, of Martin Luther King Jr. and the power of what we can do together. 1963, the great rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel 
comes to Chicago. He wants to do what Hindus call darshan with King. He wants to see him up close, in front, in person. King brings his sermon on Amos. Let justice rain down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Heschel later says that hearing that talk felt like the soul of Judaism was at stake in the civil rights movement. Two years later, Heschel risks his life with King in the march in Selma, a march that began on the Edmund Pettus Bridge where the blood is still not dry from the amount of violence that took place. The civil rights movement was a movement of people of different faiths building the freedom of all of us. And in 1999, when I was in Cape Town, South Africa, seeing Nelson Mandela speak, and he stood up and he said, I just want you to know that I would still be out there. And he pointed across the Cape to Robben Island, where he spent 26 years of his life in prison. I would still be out there if it wasn't for the different religious communities, the Jews and the Christians, the African traditionalists and the Muslims, the Hindus and the Buddhists and the secular humanists working together in the struggle against apartheid. That's the legacy that we inherit. That's the path that we walk. That's what interfaith leaders have done in the past. And as I walk across Augsburg College and I keep seeing these signs, we are called. I think to myself, at a time when religious identity is as flammable as it has ever been, I think that's what a generation of people are called to do again. And I got to tell you, I go to a lot of college campuses, but I think that there's something special about this place, special about the tradition that inspired it, special about the diversity of the student body, special about this broader community. I drove by a Mediterranean gyro spot, a halal butcher, to a Native American art gallery and coffee shop and said salam to a Somali family. And I looked at my watch and 90 seconds had gone by. I got to tell you, I don't know of that many other places in America that, has that, that have that density of diversity. But diversity all, isn't always a good thing. Diversity is just a fact. Diversity could be that starving village where people are in their huts, huddled alone, scared of each other. Diversity could be Baghdad five years ago, which was a civil war. Diversity could be Belfast over much of the last 30 years, which was, again, a civil war. What does it take to make a community who knows that they're better together? It takes leadership. And one of the most startling things about this legacy of interfaith cooperation is that so often those leaders have been young people. Mandela, when he started the Youth League of the African National Congress, was 26. Gandhi, when he started his movement against the racist pass laws, was 24. King, when he engaged Gandhi, was a student. He was where you are. He was 20. And the Dalai Lama, when he moves his people out of occupied Tibet and sets up a government in exile in India and begins a robust dialogue with the Hindus and Muslims and Jains of that nation, was barely out of his teens. I think to myself, as I look back on that moment with Barack Obama in the Oval Office, I, those weren't his talking points that he was reading. That wasn't a sheet of paper that he was speaking from. As we walked out, my friend Joshua Dubois, who runs the faith office for, for the president, I asked him, like, where did he get that from? And Dubois said, I have no idea. It's not what I told him to say. You go back in Barack Obama's autobiography, Dreams from My Father, and you read the chapter on Chicago, and you know what you find out? That when he was in his early 20s, barely graduated from college, he was in that city bringing together Catholic churches, 
Protestant churches, Muslim communities working under the mentorship of a Jewish organizer in programs that led to tutoring efforts, that led to job creation efforts. Barack Obama, in the mid-1980s, as an early 20-something, was an interfaith leader. So as he looked out around the world and saw religious identity be a barrier of division and a bomb of destruction, I think he reached back into his own history and thought to himself, what if a critical mass of young people, critical mass of college students, chose the vocation of bringing people from different backgrounds together? It honors our traditions. It honors our nation. It's an absolute requirement in the world in which we live. I want to say something about that world in closing. Here's what we know from the last week. We didn't know it already. That ugliness moves fast. There are channels in which that pulse just goes like this. And if some folks in the desert of Southern California want to make a film that is really an incitement to violence. There are folks on the other side of the world willing to take that pitch and hit it out of the ballpark. And then you just see this conflagration of ugliness. But those channels are neutral. So if people can put ugliness on them and they can move across the world that fast, other people, us, can put something else in that channel. We can put beauty and it can move across the world equally fast, and it can inspire equal beauty. I think to myself, in 1950, a young black Baptist student learned about the example of an Indian Hindu in the Satyagraha movement, and took that pulse of beauty and built from it a movement that moved America closer to the idea of a beloved community. And he didn't have email. And he couldn't text. He had to play with beauty back and forth in an analog world. What does it look like if Augsburg College, if its students, its staff and faculty commit right here to a beloved community what happens if those pulses travel? Might they find receptive hands, open eyes, willing hearts in Cairo, in Benghazi, in Kabul? I can't promise that. But we play with possibility. We have to believe in that possibility. Here's what I do believe at the bottom of my heart that what the interfaith scholars, Amina Safi, Angelo, Bonfiglio, Ibrahim al-Hijabi, what all of you are doing to build better together on this campus and with that community right next door, I can't promise you it will have global import, but I can promise you that it matters cosmically. For my tradition, God loves beauty and is beautiful from Dostoevsky. It is ultimately beauty that will save the world from William Stafford, American poet. If you don't take the time to get to know me and I don't take the time to get to know you, then a pattern that others made may prevail in this world. And following the wrong God home, we could miss our star. Those who are awake must be awake now because a falling line threatens to lull us back to sleep. The signals we give, yes or no or maybe, must be clear now because the darkness around us is deep. Jazakallah, may God give you goodness. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Ikibu. It is just such a privilege to, to hear you again and to be inspired by you again. But of course, I know that your great love is to engage with students, so I want to uh, open things up now. Uh, Leslie is out in the audience with a microphone. If you have a question or a comment, she would love to uh, bring the microphone to you. And Ibu has agreed to uh, take message. We have about uh, 12 or 15 minutes. So please just raise your hand, and I will bring the microphone to you. Um. Don't be shy. Here we go. For those who aren't like directly engaged in the Interfaith Youth Scholars Program, how do you, um, how do you get engaged? So that's a great, is that a setup? Because that's a great question. <laughs> so, so the three students whose names I butchered, I am so sorry about that. Can you all stand up? Are you all here? <laughs> sorry about that, Ibrahim. OK. so. My guess is that excellent leaders as they are, they are going to be sending out posters and flyers about what the next steps are. But Augsburg is, an, is, is a part of, a, a, of, a hu of several huge exciting processes. One is my colleagues, Laura and Kyle, are partners in something called a model campus engagement, where we're looking at how Augsburg College can improve on, on how it's a model campus of interfaith cooperation. President Pribinow has signed off on the, the president, as in President Obama's interfaith campus, interfaith uh, uh, and community service campus challenge. And finally, Ibrahim and those other students are going to be leading something called a Better Together campaign. So, you know, just keep your eyes open. Um, hopefully, you'll get something in your email box soon about what some of the next steps are. So, thank you for your question. Well, to add on to that is simply engaging with other students of different faiths and backgrounds. It itself interfaith. You don't necessarily be part of an organization, but um, I find it interesting that we take classes with certain students and they have this um, understanding about Islam or Muslims without coming, ever coming up to us and asking us what is this or why are you wearing this or why do you guys bow down and such things like that. So don't hesitate to ask questions. Great. Thank you for that. Um, what are more like daily and formal ways that people can engage in either interfaith conversations or standing up against prejudice or stereotypes or educating themselves? What are some what are some ideas that you have for people besides like the formal interfaith activities? Thank you for that. That that's a great question. So I think what the previous student said is a great is a great example is that you have this warm and welcoming community here that that is blessed with people from a range of different backgrounds. And it's the, Augsburg is the kind of place, from what I understand, that you can ask questions of people. You can engage in stories with people. So use your classes, use the, your athletics programs, use your student organizations as a place where, even if you're playing sports or studying chemistry together, it's an opportunity to build a positive, meaningful relationship with somebody from a different background and to learn something appreciative about their tradition. Right? So I remember the, the president of, of my university when I was, when I was a student said that, uh, this is in the, in the mid-1990s, that he wanted to make sure that the University of Illinois was an ecology where people were developing multicultural literacy, building multicultural friendships, and leading multicultural projects. So Augsburg is that same ecology. And I would only add to what, what the president of my campus said, the issue of faith identity, which was left off the table for too long. And the problem when a dimension of identity is, is not talked about by the forces of pluralism is that it becomes flammable in the hands of the forces of prejudice. So you have a wonderful opportunity here at Augsburg College to advance a positive, proactive conversation about faith, to get to know people of different religious backgrounds. Everybody from secular humanists to Hindus to Muslims to Lutherans to Catholics and, and on and on and on. Right, so, so use this warm and welcoming ecology to learn things about other people's traditions and to get to know people of other faiths. Uh, 
Hi, thank you. Um, my question is if you could just share one story of interfaith work off of a campus setting. I, I'm, I adore this um, community here, but I'm not part of the Augsburg uh, campus and I'm trying to fly the flag of better together in my own community, so I'd love to hear just one story. Sure, I, I will happily tell you a story. You. Let, me, let me just say that I, I think in, in response to the previous question, I think I, I missed a very important opportunity, which is to plug the religion department here at Augsburg College. <laughs> and I'm quite serious about that, right? Take, take those classes. Right? I mean, the, the wonder, if you're a chemistry major, if you're a biology major, you can still take classes that will give you a formal enrichment of the diversity of religions in, in the country and in the world, and a formal enrichment of the tradition that inspired this college, and how this Lutheran tradition views it as part of who it is to welcome people of other faiths. Right? That intersection, that intersection of, of my faith and your faith, that's a powerful intersection, and there's no place like a college campus to, to get formal knowledge about that. So take those classes. To the question of, of a, a good example in a community, you know, there's, there's actually one in the community that I grew up in. So I grew up in the western suburbs of Chicago, which uh, some years back started to get a, have, have a growing homelessness problem. And it didn't have the resources to start a formal homeless shelter. So at a community meeting um, about how to deal with this homelessness problem, Lutheran pastor gets up and says, so look, we could probably keep our church open on Tuesday nights, right? And we could, we could host those folks and give them a warm meal on Tuesday nights. Presbyterian pastor stands up next and is like, well, we could probably do that in, on, on Wednesday nights. Rabbi stands up and said, we could do that on Sunday nights. And this literally happened. And now you have a program in the western suburbs of Chicago where different faith communities host homeless folks every night of the week. And it's because the government didn't have the resources to do it or chose not to invest in that direction. So it was different faith communities offering their social capital, right? Like literally slicing up their carrots, their celeries, and putting it in that, in that stone soup pot. And I, I love that example because it, it, it integrates those three things, voice, engage, and act. People had to stand up and say, my tradition wants to be of benefit to this broader community. People had to engage with each other and actually be there from different religious backgrounds side by side. And then ultimately, they, they did the most inspiring thing of all, which was to act together. So I think you know, the, the fancy term for this is bridged social capital. And social scientists like Robert Putnam at Harvard say that religious communities are the deepest repositories of social capital in America. The problem is, too often, they, they cycle in their own circles. And the challenge is, how do you bridge that capital? And you know, I'm a little bit slow, so it took me like 10 years to realize this, but I realized that you know, bridges don't fall from the sky. Somebody builds the bridge. Right? Somebody decides, we're going to have the Jews and the Muslims and the Lutherans and the Catholics coming together to start a homelessness program in our community. Otherwise, they're just going to keep doing things on their own. Thanks for your inspiring talk. Uh, when I read your autobiography, uh, Acts of Faith, I was um, um, interested to find out that as only as you went deeper in your own Muslim tradition, when you became, in a way, a better Muslim, did you get involved in this work? In some, in some ways, you, I think you were saying that you really got to go deep in order to go wide. And um, maybe you wouldn't put it that way, but could you speak more? speak more about that, yeah. about, about the importance of being rooted in a tradition in order mm -hmm. to cross into and work with people of other traditions. Right. So thank you for that. So yeah, there are, there are many metaphors for this. There's depth and width, there's roots and wings. And uh, um, so a couple things on this. One is, um, you know, people have their own paths in this. And, and my path actually starts by being inspired uh, uh, as as a 19-year-old by Dorothy Day, by, by the Catholic Worker Movement, and spending you know, a whole summer uh, in Catholic worker houses up and down the, the eastern seaboard, which prompted this conversation with my father. Wasn't Yale Law School the plan? What, what the heck are you doing sleeping on the floor of Catholic worker houses in Washington, DC? Um, so that was the beginnings of my path, and it was actually 
the example of Dorothy Day and Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Rabbi Heschel and Thich Nhat Hanh and Mahatma Gandhi and King that started to ask, that started for me asking questions about my own faith. And so there were, I think, multiple threads moving together. And as I write in Acts of Faith, they, they finally click for me in the figure of Rumi when I'm in my early 20s uh, in graduate school at Oxford. Um, and, and this sense of, of where my commitment, I, I want my ultimate commitments to lie. But I, I think that there are, there are multiple paths to this. Um, and I, wanna, I think that we ought to appreciate and respect those, those various paths. My path happened to be one of uh, where I currently deepen roots in Islam and hopefully widen in knowledge and appreciation of other traditions. And, you know, that's really the story of the last 18 years of my life. I just did a talk at Union Theological Seminary um, on, on, on Martin Luther King Jr. and on the influence that Mahatma Gandhi and Thich Nhat Hanh had on him. Thich Nhat Hanh, the great Buddhist, uh, the great Buddhist monk from Vietnam. And the metaphor that I used there was that what, what they did for him was illuminate new rooms in his Christian house. Right, so King, and one of, for me, one of the most inspiring things about King is just how clear he is about his, his, his commitment to Christianity. Right, 1967, uh, uh, at Riverside Church on April 4th, when he gives his big sermon against Vietnam, he says, people ask me why I'm here and why I'm coming out against the Vietnam War, and they say that I am, I am ruining the civil rights movement by by uh, engaging with this other issue. They say, you know, just focus on Montgomery and Memphis. Just focus on, on segregation. Don't focus on foreign policy. He says, don't you get it? I'm here because I'm a Christian. I'm here because, because my commission from Jesus Christ calls me to speak out for all those who are suffering. He also says in, this talk, in that talk, he quotes the great Buddhist monks of Vietnam, and he says that this has been an agonizing two years for him. So why two years? Because in 1965, King receives a letter from Thich Nhat Hanh in which Thich Nhat Hanh says, you as a Christian have to come out against this war. So it was Jesus that inspires King to come to Riverside in 1967, but it's Thich Nhat Hanh that pushes him there. Right? And I love finding those examples of people with, as, as I think you're alluding to, this, who, this clear house of faith within them but there are rooms in that house that are illuminated by people from other traditions. That, by the way, was admittedly a story of ultimate interfaith nerddom. <laughs> I hope that you didn't mind me sharing it with you. And I think we'll take one more here. Thank you for your presentation. I'm concerned about this upcoming political um, arena that we're entering in that I have heard from a number of people that unless you're a true Christian, you're not a true American and that I have heard that uh, some people believe that our president is of the Muslim faith, therefore not a true Christian. So what can we do to combat the politics that are flying around us at this time in a positive way so that we can all identify with the one supreme being? Thank you. Thank you for that. So, you know, I begin this, this, this new book that I've got um, with, with a story of despair. Um, uh, which, you know, is kind of links to what, you, what you're just saying, which is this was two years ago during the madness around, around the Grand Zero Mosque where I was teetering between anger and despair and just thinking to myself, I feel like my nation has entered the twilight zone and happily, right? Uh, when they want to turn a Muslim YMCA five blocks from where an imam has had a masjid for 20 years into a terrorist command center. And I got a call out of the blue from one of my mentors, Sheikh Hamza Youssef. And um, he basically said to me, you're getting this wrong, Ibu, right? M moments when prejudice is out in the open are the moments that change agents yearn for. Because you don't have to convince people that there's a problem. It's right out there. What you have to do is offer a more beautiful story. And it's going to take a long time. Don't expect it to be short. Right. This is the thing, you know, King in 1956, when he talks about injecting a new, uh, a new dimension of love in the veins of the civilization and building the beloved community, he doesn't think it's going to happen the next day. He thinks that this is a 30-year march, maybe longer, 
right? So the crazy thing about how evident religious prejudice and religious violence are is that there are all sorts of people who are like, well, we know we don't want to live in that world. And so what does that give us the chance to do? Build a different world that a lot of people want to live in. The worst thing in the world is irrelevance. The worst thing in the world is to talk about interfaith cooperation and people be like, well, I just don't know why that matters, right? When, when I first started getting involved in interfaith work in 1997, 98, 99, one of my high school friends was like, dude, what happened to you? You went off and joined the Flat Earth Society. <laughs> and my, my friends in graduate school were like, well, why don't you find a, a 13th century rock and do a study of that? Because it would be more relevant than talking about religion in this day and age. I'll tell you something. Nobody's condemning us to irrelevance now. What they're saying is, we don't know if you can win. And that's where faith comes in. Whatever your faith is in, that's where faith comes in. To know that this is a long, long journey, right? But lots of people have been on long journeys. And we inherit a world that they built because they believed that at the end of that long journey was the possibility of beauty. And so they walked that path. And that's what we do now. We walk the next leg of that path. We write the next chapter in the story. And in 30 years, there's going to be a group of kids at Augsburg College sitting right there right, who are like, wow, Augsburg has these great campus community partnerships. Wow, Augsburg has this vibrant Better Together campaign. And you're going to be somewhere being like, yeah, it didn't drop from the sky. Right? At a time when religious identities were blowing each other up on the evening news, we built that at Augsburg. We built that in this community. We're proud to, to be a part of that with you. Thank you.